Mr. Klein here with our third and final lesson of our chapter. This one is on the energy and chemical reactions. In other words, the idea of energy and how it interacts with chemical reactions. Uh, so we're going to discuss that and let's go ahead and let's get started. So, you know, chemical reactions are pretty cool. You can do things like make ghosts and things of that nature. But energy has a lot to do with chemical reactions. And energy is usually required for an chemical reaction to take place and sometimes energy is released and what we're going to do is we're going to look at the relationship between energy and chemical reactions here and yes I keep on saying energy and chemical reactions after all that is what this lesson's about so let's go ahead and let's get going now all chemical reactions like I said require energy just like your body needs energy to do everyday tasks and which your body is a whole lot of them by the way eating digesting uh, thinking all of these things require chemical reactions energy is needed to break the chemical bonds of the reactants okay as well as for new ones being to put together okay now how much energy is needed for this chemical reaction to pay, take place depends on the type of chemical reaction as well as some other factors Composition reactions usually need more energy than decomposition reactions, for instance, because it's easier to tear something apart than it is to build it together. So let's go ahead and let's create our graphic organizer. We're going to follow a trail filling this out, uh, and it's kind of a summary of the lesson. Now, chemical reactions need energy to break and reform bonds. Okay, so go ahead and write this down, and make sure you have some space in your notes for this graphic organizer to take place. Okay, so now that we have that, Let's talk about how does energy affect the start of a chemical reaction. You know, you know the feeling. It's the end of the day. You want your smartphone. You get a text message from somebody. You go to turn it on, and it's got like 1%. And you try to start tapping out a text message really quick to say you need to charge your phone, and it dies. And it does the same thing over and over. Well, just like a smartphone, chemical reactions need energy to get going. If it doesn't have enough energy, it's not going to work. Now, the... Energy needed to start a chemical reaction is what we call the activation energy, okay? Which makes sense, is the energy needed to activate the chemical reaction. Once you get above that threshold, once you get above that level of energy, everything takes off and goes from there. Some chemical reactions require more activation energy than others. And you can even change the amount of activation energy required for the same chemical reaction in several ways. And we'll talk about that some more as we go on at the last part of the lesson. So, once again, activation energy is the amount of energy required for the chemical reaction to take place, and it all depends on the chemical reaction. So, activation energy, like I just said, is the amount of energy needed to start a reaction. So let's go ahead and let's add that to our organizer as we move back across. Okay, so what are chemical reactions that require energy? You know, chemical reactions can be, it can be categorized rather by how energy is handled in the reaction. Some chemical reactions require energy to be constantly pumped into it. In other words, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a tire that you got to pump air in order to fill it up in order for it to operate. Okay, this is what we call an endothermic reaction. Endo meaning in, thermic meaning heat. Okay, but in this case, we don't just mean heat, but also energy. An endothermic reaction follows this chemical equation. The reactants plus the energy yields the products. As you can see, the energy goes in with the reactants in order to create the products. Endothermic reactions usually require heat to keep going, so heat is always being brought into the reaction. But this just means energy in general. A good example of an inner, as a result, the temperature of a substance usually drops. Uh, we'll do a chemical reaction in class where you can see this happen really, really quickly. And you'll look at an example in a second. A good example of an endothermic reaction that does not require energy, uh, heat rather, is photosynthesis. In order for the plant to create the sugar and the oxygen, uh, you have to have lots of light energy coming in for the chloroplast to use it. Uh, in order to bind with the, uh, in order to use the uh, carbon dioxide. Okay, there has to be a constant light supply for photosynthesis to take place. Turn off the lights, there's no photosynthesis that can take place because there is no supply of energy. So we're going to look at an endothermic reaction right here. Okay, so they're pouring in a substance. Okay, it doesn't look like much. Shake it, turn it around, it kind of dissolves. Okay, that, that's interesting. It's actually getting really cold, and it's so cold it actually freezes to the piece of metal right there okay so that's an endothermic reaction the whole time that was taking place 
the endothermic reaction was taking place, what you had was heat being drawn in for the bonds to tear apart like you see and come back together. So it gets put there. And there you go. There you go. It's nice and frozen, okay, because the water in the air froze with that. So let's go ahead. We're going to talk about two types of chemical reactions. Endothermic reactions is the first one, okay? Now, what are chemical reactions that give off energy? What's the opposite, if you will? It's an exothermic reaction or a chemical reaction that requires less energy to break the chemical bonds and the reactants than is released. So in other, instead of requiring energy to be brought into the chemical reaction, it needs energy to be let go because it has too much, so it lets go of it. So the, the average equation or the sample equation looks like this. The reactants yield the energy plus the products. See, energy is on the other side of the arrow. That means it's being released once the chemical reaction takes place. Exothermic reactions are most commonly associated with the release of heat. You, sometimes it can be light, it can be other things. Combustion reactions are exothermic reactions because the burning of the fuel releases not only light energy, but also heat. Okay, so we have this reaction. This is exothermic. It's not specifically a fire per se. It's not specifically a combustion reaction. Rather, this is a decomposition reaction. So as it's breaking down, the energy from the chemical bonds is being released. Okay, so the heat and light being put out of this are forms of energy that were stored in the chemical bonds before. So let's go ahead and let's add this in. Endothermic reactions, of course, need energy to keep going. Exothermic reactions release energy during a chemical reaction. So there we go. We're almost there. Okay, so we're talking about the types of chemical reactions in terms of energy. Okay, so let's talk about some ways to change the rate of the chemical reaction to use up the energy, uh, if you will. Okay, the rate or the speed of the chemical reaction can be affected in several ways. Usually this involves the amount of activation energy necessary to start the reaction by increasing the number of particles available to react with each other. And there are four major ways we can do this. And three of them are related to uh, the amount of particles being able to interact at the beginning. The first one is temperature. Remember, temperature is merely the measurement of the amount of particles bouncing into each other. Chemicals usually react faster to higher the temperature. Obviously, the particles are bouncing into each other faster, so it only makes sense that the faster they're bouncing into each other, the more opportunities there are for them to start reacting. The next one is the concentration of reactants. Okay, the closer the particles are together, the better chance for them to bounce into another reactant in order for the chemical reaction to take place. The next one is increased surface area. Powdered substances react faster than solid chunks because there's more opportunities to react. You can try this with baking soda and vinegar. If you have baking soda and you let it kind of dry out, it kind of bonds together and becomes a big chunk of it. So you put it down, you pour the vinegar on it, and it reacts pretty quickly. But if you put baking soda in a powder and you spread it out and you pour the vinegar on top of it, it reacts even faster. That's because there's more baking soda molecules sitting around for the vinegar to react with. Now, the final one involves a chemical. And you don't need to know much more than just the fact that what it is and kind of how it works. Uh, so we're just going to introduce it to you. It's called a catalyst. Sometimes some chemicals are added to speed up a chemical reaction, but are not used in the reaction itself. In other words, the chemical just stays there and it kind of speeds up the chemical reaction or even slows it down. These chemicals are what we call catalysts. And if you remember this lab that we did in class uh, previously, the elephant toothpaste, is a decomposition reaction of hydrogen peroxide. Okay, and the catalyst is actually yeast. Okay, yeast takes the hydrogen peroxide and pulls it apart way faster. Okay, and so as a result, the decomposition happens so quickly, just like what you see in the little animation right here. Okay, without, without, uh, without a, the presence of catalysts, the, the hydrogen peroxide breaks down but it takes much longer. And if you notice the steam, that's heat. So obviously this elephant toothpaste reaction or decomposition of hydrogen peroxide is an exothermic reaction. It's releasing heat once it's taken place. So let's go ahead and let's finish off our graphic organizer. Okay, so we've talked about how chemical reactions need energy to break and reform bonds. Activation energy is the amount of energy needed to start a reaction. 
Okay, and speaking of reactions in energy, there's two types of chemical reactions regarding energy. One is endothermic reactions, it, where you need energy to keep the reaction going. The other is exothermic reactions, where energy is released during the reaction. And you can control the speed of a reaction in one of four ways. By temperature, the warmer it is, the faster the reaction will take place. Concentration, the more particles are there, the faster it'll take place as there are more chance of them bumping into each other. Okay, then there's a surface area. You increase the surface area available to react, the faster it'll take place. And finally, you have a catalyst, which is a chemical or a substance put into uh, the reactants that either speeds up or slows down the reaction, but doesn't actually change in a chemical reaction. So there you go. That's your lesson. That's your final lesson in the chapter on chemical reactions. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. And if, as always, you have any questions, please let me know. And thanks for watching. Thank you.